parks, schools, restaurants, and more, Assembly Row gets high scores. We're a thriving city with so much to do. Uncle Boston Harbor in our view. Politics, cannabis, controversial stories, heroes, and villains. Who gets the glory? 50 plus languages in Somerville are spoken. Sanctuary City, there are no three tokens. History in Somerville stays alive. In all American cities, we won three times. Somerville connects. Somerville connects. Welcome to another edition of Dead Air Live, the longest live running TV show in America and audio podcast, Somerville Connects. Tonight, we have Sheer Ginsburg, postdoctoral research fellow. And we're talking about the study on Half Trap. Welcome, Sheer. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for having me on. It's my pleasure. Cher, we met each other through a common friend on the internet uh, about a month ago. And, and you approached me about doing, possibly being a person that would participate in an ear purification program. So Cher, tell us a little bit about who you are and what led you up to the study of Half Trap. It's a good question. So I'm... I am a postdoctoral research fellow at UConn Health. That's the medical school at the University of Connecticut. Although most of the research is based in Somerville in the Boston area. Um, I will say my, my previous experience, you know, it's, it's not been in air quality. It's, it's one of those situations where you find yourself in places where you didn't think you would end up, which is a good thing in this case, because I'm, you know, learning a lot as I go along. Um, I, a lot of my experience has been working with chronic health and mental health. So I've been working a lot with mental health, um, diabetes, um, food insecurity, and mostly with Hispanics and Puerto Ricans. You know, I, I used to work in New York, working with a big study on Hispanic health, and I lived in Puerto Rico for a couple of years for my thesis, um, talking to people, collecting data. And most of it, as I said, was on um, mental health and food insecurity and politics. So when I came to this study, I was I just I was transitioning from a previous job that had lost funding, and a friend of mine referred me to the study. And I thankfully I was I was hired. I was in need of a job, but the study is on air quality, and it was something that had always been peripheral to the research that I was doing, you know, you, you talk to people and you ask them one question or ask them, you know, how is, is it easy, for example, is it easier for you to, to get to a supermarket? Do you have a car or can you get, get on a bus? Or you ask them, you know, so how's your mental health or whatever it is that you're asking them. And it's never just, oh yeah, I can get on a bus and get to the market in five minutes. It's always, you ask them, oh, you know, can you get to the, can you get to the market? And they start telling you about, well, I can take a bus, but when the air quality is bad, I don't want to leave the house. And that leads to a different conversation. And, you know, because I was of where I was in, in Puerto Rico, I was in the, in the big city of San Juan, you end up talking to people about not just food insecurity, but it also relates to the environment and how people are taking care of the environment and, it was also a conversation that I had with people when I was in New York. Um, so the awareness of environmental health more broadly was always there in, you know, in, in the back of the conversations we were having with people. So when I got to this study, although I didn't know at the beginning a huge amount about air quality, it was something that I learned very quickly and something that made a whole lot of sense because air, air quality does affect our health. It affects everything from, um, you know, asthma rates to stress to just about everything. And, you know, when I was living in New York, all of our work was in the Bronx, which has a lot of highways and interstates going through it. So that was something that came up a lot at that point as well. People talking about the, the air quality of you know, all of the highways and the cars and the traffic and, everything. So getting here was, now that I think back on it, 
made a lot of intuitive sense. So hindsight, I guess. But so it's it's really good to be part of the study and um, see where it's going. We we only just started recruiting people, so we don't really have any results to share yet. But it's it's been a good learning experience and gives me the opportunity to talk to people and more importantly, really to listen to them. Because, you know, I, I can talk to people and I can ask the questions, but hearing what they have to say is really the more interesting part. Okay, so can you tell us what does half trap stand for? Yep, so half trap stands for home air filtration for traffic related air pollution. So it's a, it's a wordy title, so we call it half trap for short. It's a bit easier to say. So it's home, air filter, traffic, air? Yep, home air filtration for traffic-related air pollution. Okay, beautiful. And do you find that people from New York or Puerto Rico or Somerville, Mass., do they all have the same issues with air quality or does it differ? I would say at least um, at least people in the Bronx have very similar issues to what's happening in Somerville, you know, with all of the highways and the traffic. And because it's also a very populated, very dense um, neighborhood, town, city. Um, Puerto Rico, definitely, because I, I would say at least half the population of the island lives in San Juan. So it's also very dense, but they also have compounded issues with other environmental things that are happening, like Hurricane Maria that happened in 2017 and the earthquakes that happened in the beginning of 2020. So they have similar issues, but compounded with other environmental problems that we don't see as often as um, farther north. So let's talk about an air quality problem that I think it's a silent killer. Yeah. There are people, and I'm sure maybe in Puerto Rico they're dealing with this. It's called mold, M O L D. And I'll bring up I'll bring up this uh, story. I was in Manzanillo, Mexico, and I was with my mother, and I was on this uh, all inclusive vacation, which I thought was going to be beautiful. And we walked into our hotel room, which was sea level. The beach was a very short walk. And the place smelt so bad. Yeah. We were intoxicated with severe mold, not mild mold. It was severe. Yeah. They told me that the room was hit with, I don't, it wasn't a tsunami, but it was a hurricane where the water actually hit the ceiling. Wow. So they never got the mold out of the room. Yeah. And, my, and my mother said to me, I am not staying here. My mother never, com never complained, just never complained. And so I had to seek shelter somewhere else. Now, I know that people have mold in their home. Sometimes it's in their basement. Sometimes it's in their walls. Yeah. And that can create air quality with, and give people all different types of sicknesses. Is that something that your study also investigates or is it just with traffic? It's primarily with traffic right now. Um, not to say that mold, not to say that we don't know that mold is a problem because it is. Um, and I, I have a good friend who had a, a problem similar to you in her house. She lives, close, you know, right along the coast in Connecticut and they had a similar problem with the mold that they actually had to leave the house because the mold was so bad. Um, so it's something that we're aware of as an issue that we're hoping maybe we can look at it at a, at a future time. So the studies focus very specifically on um, air quality with traffic, but something mold is definitely something that we can look at in the future. How many people do you need for a study to be complete for it to for you to get the results? How many subjects do you yeah. need? It's a good question. So for us specifically, we're looking for two hundred and forty people, and that can be spread out. Um, among about 200 homes with the acknowledgement that, you know, some homes will have one person, some homes will have two or three people in it. So we're not, we're looking for households 
with, you know, different amounts of people and it, it gets some diversity, but we're looking for 240 people. Um, does, you know, does age make a difference or are there health challenges if they have any, if they smoke? It's a good question. So people, we're looking for participants who are at least 40 and they can't, cannot smoke. And we need, we're, we're looking for people who hopefully have not had a heart attack in the past few months or um, can, um, heart attack or cancer in the past few months. If you've had a, if you, if you had cancer five or 10 years ago, that's okay. Cause it's been a while, but I'm um, just, because part of what we do with the study is we're taking um, blood samples from you a few times throughout the study. Um, so we're looking, part of what we're looking at is the effect of air pollution and air filtration on cardiovascular health. So we're looking for what, you know, whether the air, whether the air pollution affects um, your health, your heart. So we just, we wanted to have a baseline for, for um, to, to compare to, I suppose. When people live near the highway, like myself, I live near 93 North. Yeah. In some places, there are barriers that are put up. Does that help with the air quality or is it still an unknown? It does. I know there's been some research saying that having, you know, like a wall or plant life, having a bunch of trees does help. Um, so there's, there's still research on how much that helps whether it's, you know, a, a wall versus some other kind of barrier like trees, but it has been shown to be helpful. So we're just looking at how that does help. One, I don't think you asked me this question when you interviewed me. You did not ask me if I had plant life in my home. Right, because that, right now that um, it doesn't matter. If, I mean, it matters, it matters we want you to be happy, but it doesn't affect the outcome of the study if you have plants in the house or not. But but doesn't um, having plants in your home, doesn't that create more fresh oxygen and you feel fabulous when you have fresh oxygen? I mean, doesn't that affect your air quality on some level? It does on some level. I think that in this case, because we're looking for people who live very close to the highway, we're looking for people who live within 200 meters which is about 650 feet. I think that the effects of having a house plant or flowers in the house, were, I don't know how much of an effect that's going to have on people who live that close to the highway. Uh, my sister is, she's the plant whisperer. And she told me something. I don't remember exactly, but she says you're supposed to have so many plants, so many feet apart, and you will not get sick. Yeah. And I went, okay. And I think it's one plant every 10 feet. She has a ton of plants in her house, and she never gets sick. I mean, absolutely. Having plants in the house is a good thing. Um, and that's something that maybe we can look at down the line. Uh, we're not set up to to look at the effects of plants on air pollution in houses yet, um, but it's something that we can consider looking at, like with the mold. So one of the questions I want to ask you is, you spoke about you've worked in New York City, you've worked in Puerto Rico, and you've also are uh, working now in the Boston area. Uh, does... You have, do you have more, you have an intrigue towards Hispanic people. Do they have more health challenges than, let's say, people in America? Um, yes and no. I mean, I think also with the consideration that Hispanic is a very broad term. You know, you have Mexicans and Puerto Ricans and Cubans and Argentinians and um, everyone comes with their own set of challenges. Um, like for example, Hispan the Puerto Ricans I've worked with have certain challenges with mental health versus diabetes. Um, cancer rates tend to be a little bit better. Um, so um, that they were pretty high for a while. Heart problems depends on the group. So 
they, they definitely have their own health challenges compared to African Americans or Native Americans or different Asian American groups. So it's something that, you know, it's, there's definitely a lot of work out there on that right now. And, and what about people, the food that they eat? Let's say someone eats a lot of cheese and dairy. Yeah. They're going to have a lot of, um, they're going to have a lot of mucus, which is going to create a lot of issues with breathing and respiratory because people don't understand how, how dairy affects the body. Uh, does that have anything to, is that associated with, with your study at all? Not with the study, we're not looking specifically at food intake, but there's also the understanding that this is the kind of like a base study. So we're collecting all of this data and we're looking at, you know, the air filters and we're taking a blood sample, some blood samples, and we're looking at the quality of your home. But down the line, you know, we might decide to focus on a specific area and say, okay, a lot of people have been talking about this thing or that thing. You know, we ask about stress, we ask about asthma and all of these things. So we might decide to do a a smaller study that focuses just on food intake or public transportation or plants in the home. So not ruling it out for the future. Does stress affect air quality? Um. I would say, at least with what I've seen so far in understanding that, you know, there are maybe a lot of different complicated relationships that air quality can affect stress. You know, if I, that having a lot of bad air quality in the home can make people stressed out. So okay. that, that's one of the, actually one of the studies that we're thinking of doing in the near future, looking at stress and air quality specifically. I'll share something with you that you probably don't know. I am a professional singer and my singing and acting coach told me that when your body is very, very tired, you cannot sing correctly. And I've noticed that when I'm exhausted, my nasal cavities get very stuffed up. Yeah. And it affects my uh, breath, yeah. my 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 elko and breath to to sing. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if that's something that you're considering that people are not sleeping enough, yeah. and that can affect air quality as well. But that's just my own humble yeah. input. Yeah. No, no, no. There's there's absolutely a lot to do with sleep and other health outcomes for sure. Um, so that's something that you know, it's in the back of our collective kind of research minds for something to do in the future um, that we're going to, you know, we, we have a few questions. Are you stressed out? Do you have any other health problems they, that, you know, bother you um, that something we can do for the future? So, what yeah. What is your ultimate goal with your study? We wanted to see if these air filters. So what we're doing with the study is we're installing air filters in people's homes. So there'll be one in the living room and one in the bedroom, and they'll be in there for three months. We go in, we turn it on, we live it there for a month, we come back, we turn it off, and then we let it just sit there for a month. And then we turn it back on and we let it sit for on for another month. And then we turn it off. And what we wanted to see was if having a filter improves um, the air quality in the home and whether it reduces exposure to air pollution and benefits your health. And that's part of why we're taking the blood samples. We're also taking blood pressure. Is one of the ultimate goals for an air purification company to sell these systems to people? Nope, we're not selling anything. We're not expecting people to buy anything. We're an academic study, so nobody will be expected to pay for anything as part of the study. Great. And if it's my understanding that people, after you draw blood from them, I think it's three or four times, they get paid $300, correct? So we, we draw, we, we're going to draw blood four times, and 
people get $300 total and we break that up into $75 gift cards that they get after each blood draw. Beautiful. Yep. Beautiful. Well, I think you've given us quite a bit of information. Would you like to add anything for our viewers before we bid adieu? Um, I wanted to, you know, thank people for listening. And if they're interested in participating, to please let us know. We're happy to, you know, to, to talk to people and to answer questions. And if they're interested in participating, to to reach out to us. So we're, we're the study is going to, we're going to be around for a couple of years. So if they can't participate now, but want to do it later, they can. Um, so and we're looking, we're collecting data over the colder months. So we're doing, we're running the study now. It's early January and we'll be going until March or April. And then we'll take it back up in October, I think October, November, once the weather gets colder again. And Cher Ginsburg, how can people find you? So they can drop me an email. Um, the email is S Ginsburg. That's S G I N Z B as in boy, U R G at U C H C dot E D U. Okay. So that's S Ginsburg at U C H C dot E D U. Yep. They can drop me an email and I'm very responsive to emails. So. Um, if they have any questions or they want to talk to me, or, you know, they're not sure and they, you know, have some questions, they can absolutely feel free to reach out and talk. Do you check your spam and your junk mail? Because sometimes when you get an email from someone you don't know, yeah. that's where it goes. Yep. I check all of my folders. Okay. Beautiful. Uh, Sheer Ginsburg, thank you so much for joining us today. I appreciate you. Thank you for having me on the show. My pleasure. And folks, thank you for listening to another edition of Dead Air Live and Somerville Connects. Bye for now. See you next time. Somerville Connects. Somerville Connects.